Welcome to Changing the Perception of Blindness, One Conversation at a Time, where we aim to break down barriers, demystify blindness, and promote real and lasting change. Join host David Steinmetz as he connects us with professionals who are making a positive impact in the community. These leaders help empower individuals who are blind or have other disabilities to live a full and inclusive life. Let's lean in as David kicks off today's conversation. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Changing the Perception of Blindness, One Conversation at a Time. I'm very, very excited to have our special guest on this morning. One of the things that is really crucial to changing the perception of blindness is advocacy, whether it's for the Ability One program or for yourself as a person who is blind. Because if you don't speak up and you don't say what it is that you need or what it is that you can do, then we really can't. And if we don't have these conversations, we can't invoke change. And I had the privilege this week to uh, go to Capitol Hill and advocate for uh, people who are blind across the U.S. He, as well as here in Arizona to increase employment opportunities for people with disabilities through the Ability One program. And I think it's critical that we have these conversations, letting our lawmakers know that I, as a person with a disability, have the right to choose where it is that I want to work, how long I want to work, et cetera, and that that should be my choice, not someone else's. And through this advocacy work, I'm able to achieve all the goals that I have set forth for myself, and I continue to set more goals and achieve higher success. And really, that's what Arizona Industries for the Blind, a social enterprise program, within the Ability One program allows me, my peers, and my community uh, to do. And so as a sponsor of this show, I'm very appreciative that I have this platform to connect with leaders in the disability community and others who are working to make the world more accessible and inclusive for people who are blind. And one of those leaders I'm really excited to bring on is, is Sharon and Sharon You were there with me in in Washington, and unfortunately, we didn't connect uh, face-to-face while we were there, but, you know, I'm very grateful for you to be here today and the work that you're doing. When I was going through preparing this this morning, I saw that you worked at RLCB, and I didn't know that. I didn't know that you did advocacy work there and, and working, you know, with our government leaders to bring awareness of the Ability One program. Would you mind me just you know, tell me a little bit more about your background. Sure. Yeah. And how can we be in the same city in the same hotel and not run into each other, especially <laughs> with each one of us having a dog? I mean, right. You know, usually they, you know, they, it, it, they make the meetings happen so much smoother. So number one, thank you so much, David, for having me on the air today. I really appreciate it. It's a great honor. So my name's Sharon Jovanazzo and I'm the CEO of the Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired of San Francisco. And um, you're right, I kind of have a past of, I don't know, 20 plus years now of being in the blind biz. And and so I joined the Lighthouse for the Blind in San Francisco in October of 22. But before that, I spent, oh, I don't know, two decades building my leadership skills. And like you said, advocating for and serving people who are blind in the low vision community. Before I came to San Francisco for eight years before, I was the president and CEO of World Services for the Blind, located in Little Rock, Arkansas, a residential rehab facility. Then I had various roles at RLCB, which was formerly known as Raleigh Lions Clinic for the Blind. And I don't know if you know this, but before um, Raleigh, I worked for National Industries for the Blind as their legislative affairs specialist. So that's really Mm -hmm. where I cut my teeth on you know, being involved in cultivation and really helping Congress to understand the program that we work under and that we operate under, you know, the federal agencies and everything under that umbrella of the Ability One program. And, you know, for anybody who's listening who doesn't know, you know, that leverages federal purchasing power to support community-based nonprofit agencies like the San Francisco Lighthouse and like um, Arizona Industries for the Blind. We have a light manufacturing facility located on the island of Alameda, right across the bay from San Francisco. So, 
and all of those programs dedicated to training and employing individuals who are blind. So that's a little bit about me and about what got me to where I'm at, David. Right. So amazing career. We met through World Services for the Blind, uh, one of your programs that you had developed in uh, computer-based training and uh, amazing work to doing to, as you had kind of in your, in your uh, bio about empowering people. And I think that's really what this program does, what when given the opportunity to succeed through a career, that's empowerment, I think. And, and that brings, and I just love when I hear that word or I see that word, and really it just means so much than just giving, I don't want to say giving, but having a job, right? Giving somebody an opportunity and giving that chance. It's, it's just amazing. It is. And, you know, you really said it right, right at the very beginning. It's about choice. You know, when I started my journey into blindness, um, I tell everybody I got my job because of baptism by fire. Um, <laughs> I started off in the rehab program in upstate New York, and I lost my vision because of MS, because of multiple sclerosis. So I was 31 years old, and I had absolutely positively no marketable skills as a person who was blind, even though I'd been a combat medic in the Army. I was working as a nurse. I was getting ready to go back to nursing school that fall. That was the fall of 2001. Um, but, you know, mm. chasing a person with a red and white cane in one hand and a needle in the other, they do a lot more damage when they jump out the window trying to get away from you. <laughs> and so I knew that I needed to refocus on that. Right. But I started off packaging gloves for the Transportation Security Administration. So, you know, whenever you go through the airport and they have those beautiful blue gloves on, you can thank a person in upstate New York for packaging those. But I needed to build the skills. I needed to learn how to be a person who was blind. And all those other skills that I had as a person who was sighted was transferable. I just didn't know that at the time. So, mm -hmm. but not only that, then I transferred over to the sewing line. And, you know, there was something that was really special about me being able to work on contracts that served our military. That was really personal to me. But there's some schools of thought, it's like, oh, well, you know, if a whole bunch of people who are blind work together, then it's not considered, you know, an employment outcome that mm -hmm. we should be out, you know, in the wild and serving wherever else. But, you know, it, it was a great job and it really allowed me to build my skills. Then I went on to become, do, do adaptive technology training. And that's really where I got my start. My CEO had identified that I had a big mouth and I wasn't afraid to use it. So <laughs> he put me in a public policy role because he had always done that. And mm -hmm. He, he, he since retired, but we just got to present him with a Lifetime Achievement Award at Vision Serve Alliance um, here recently. And, you know, all those things. And, and like I said, that choice and that empowerment, I wouldn't be where I'm at if I didn't start off with those packaging of gloves and receiving the services that I did. And that's one of the beautiful things is being able to link people. And I think just living your life the way that we live it. And every time I step outside of my door, it's my responsibility to re represent the capabilities of people who are blind in the right way mm -hmm. to say, hey, we can do anything that we want to do. Absolutely. And, and thank you. It's so, so meaningful and really what I'm advocating every single day, right? whether I'm standing at the bus stop waiting for that next bus that may or may not come uh, yeah. and having and having the conversations that, you know, what I, I'm doing living my life the way I want to live my life supporting myself, my family, et cetera. And why is that so foreign to the general population? Um, you know, misperceptions, maybe. You know, I was the first blind person I met. So I kind of thought that I'd spend the rest of my life sitting on my porch in a rocking chair. And now I just kind of wish I had a day to sit on my porch in a rocking chair. <laughs> Life has gotten pretty busy. <laughs> right, exactly. And it was... Get, once you had the opportunity, it sounds like, to obtain the skills and and build your self-confidence. And as you mentioned, use those transferable skills because those didn't go away once you lost your sight. You're still the same person. All your past experiences didn't just go away. And you're able to bring those forward into this kind of next journey of your of your life right and yeah and the the key word you're really good at key words david you know the key <laughs> word there was opportunity i was given the opportunity there was something there when i stepped foot on that manufacturing line or whether i stepped foot inside one of the agencies as a manager or a ceo i didn't have to overcome the stereotypes and the misconceptions that happen out there that 
You know, there's there's a reason why there's a 70 percent unemployment rate among working age blind adults. And Mm -hmm. well, that uh, those stats range from, you know, 30 to 70 percent. And we know how statistics work. Right. Yep. And that I didn't have to have somebody ask if I walked into a workplace is like, am I going to have to hire somebody to walk you to the bathroom? Because people just don't know. And, you know, I kind of think that it goes back to the most primitive of fears that we have that, you know, fear of darkness or, you know, the darkness meant death. Things could sneak up on you. Right. And um, I think I think that a lot of times that's what people and and we fear what we don't know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but the one thing that I, I I reassure people all the time, it's like, you know, this could happen to you. And then what would you do? I agree. And I think, you know, the work that you do, San Francisco Lighthouse does, a, a Arizona is free for blind and the whole Ability One program. I always tell people when I'm in the community, that, you know, AIB is a role model. Come and see. I can tell you all day long that people who are blind are working in all different types of jobs, positions, white collar, blue collar, entrepreneurs. And you go, okay, sure. But when you engage in and actually seek out and connect those dots together by coming in and seeing what we do or partnering with a nonprofit agency and seeing that they are going to exceed your expectations and perform to levels that you just would never have believed. And then pass that on to your colleagues in the community and continue to build that network. But I think that, that there's, like you said, that fear. Do you, Sharon, do you think that society change has been changing towards blindness in any way? I mean, we mentioned the 70% unemployment or you know, that range. And that's been a number that's been there for a long time. And too long. Too, way too long, absolutely. Do you think that things are changing in that field in terms of perception? I think they're changing. And, you know, kind of one of the things that I really have kind of thrown myself into is to see how the societal perceptions have changed over time. So, you know, kind of like if you look at, you know, the Middle Ages, you know, either it was supernatural and it was because it was you you were being punished for something or your family was being punished to people who either you were inferior or you were you had these superpowers, right? Mm-hmm. And then you get into the Enlightenment and the Renaissance periods and, you know, then reason and science, human rights started to become something. And there was an understanding of disability and that included blindness. But, you know, if you look at like philosophers like John Locke, I mean, he advocated for the education and inclusion of individuals with disabilities way before, you know, anything with the ADA came up or anything like that. And so really, we started to see a shift. But then, you know, as you get into the 1800s, you know, there was it, it, places like ours that was established. We were established in 1902. So very early on in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you had the invention of Braille, you know, something that that absolutely gave literacy to people who were blind, that it was something that they could read and they could write and they could be independent doing that. And then in the 90s, you know, during the 20th century, we had, you know, things like the ADA that, you know, talked about accessibility and talked about discrimination. And then, you know, now here we are today and you think about the advancements in technology, you think about, you know, I can do everything from something that I can hold in my hand that has more memory than something that weighed 3000 pounds and took up an entire room. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that just kind of blows my mind. But there's still that part of society that just doesn't know because they're just not educated. So, you know, I think that as we, you know, the collective, we have all of us who are out there and doing the kind of work that we're doing, just the more awareness and education, we can start to shift that perception. But really, there needs to be more representation Mm -hmm. um, whether that be in the media or in movies, you know, and all of this stuff. People who are blind just aren't represented. So the other people who's out there who's looking in, they can't imagine the things that are possible. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I often hear the term that, well, doing something like that as a person who is blind is just impossible. Hmm. Well, over the last 24 <laughs> years, I formed the opinion that they're not actually saying that it's impossible because impossible actually spells I am possible. 
Mm. And being able to go out there and kind of shout that from the rooftops to be able to say, you know, this is possible and this is why. It just there, there's still an awful lot of education that has to be done to to make it to as where the perception isn't that it's, oh, either the poor blind people or David, you're a superhero because you can get yourself to work or you can mm-hmm. do this. Because mm-hmm. we get that too, right? Absolutely. Way, way too often do we find that. I mean, and... you're my superhero, but for, <laughs> not not because you're blind, just because you're David. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And it is amazing and that the expectation is, I'm going to say, so low that... It's true people, you know, outside our, our community. And, and it shouldn't have to be that way. It should be valued for who you are, not what you are. And, and we work really hard as, as, you know, whether it's through the Ability One program, through other blindness-related, or as you call it, the blind biz, organizations that, as a collective, to say, this isn't charity, this isn't a pathway to giving something people something to do. It's not busy work. It, exactly. And and to to be able to say, yeah, I, you know, I, I was told so many times, why do you wear a watch? <laughs> well, I want to know what time it is. Um, <laughs> you can make a cup of coffee. I, it just, it, it's amazing. And so Every day, uh, so and true. <laughs> every day we're, we're faced with these expect, low expectations and, and perceptions and let you kind of hinted on whether it's in media, whether it's in leadership roles or, you know, just being in your community every day, we're kind of trying to break those, those myths that, you know, I'm, I go to the movie theater, I've. I, I don't bring my dog because he eats too much popcorn and I can't afford it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm there, I got my cane and I got my uh, descriptive audio headset and I'm enjoying the movie and being you know, like, why is there a blind guy in the movie theater? You know, and so you have these conversations or like, hey, there, you know, I met this guy, I talked to him about his guide dog and I learned this, this and this. And it's that one conversation can create the opportunities that one visibility in the community that goes, huh, I didn't think that David could water ski or attempt snowboarding. And it's just me being me. And that opportunity creates the the message that people who are blind are just people who are blind. They're, they're nothing different than, than anybody just else. people that yeah. just happen to be blind, right? Exactly. And I, I see, you know, and through our conversations and past ex- connections and you're, you're doing the same thing, whether it's, you know, on your way to work and how you get to work and communicating that out um, through your advocacy work or the, the training programs that you provide there in San Francisco to allow someone who has either recently lost their vision, obtained the skills and training that they need to be successful in the workplace whether that's with with your organization and build a career that they choose and build a career that is meaningful to them and allow them to achieve, you know, I always say that their version of the American dream, whatever that is. That's you know, right. We, we just hired a guy he's in uh, his early 30s, never worked before, never, you know, he attempted. He was first day on, on a job in a similar work environment at, that we have here at AIB. Uh, his first day on the job, he's standing at the, the production line and the supervisor like, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm the new hire, blah, blah. He's like, well, no. Mm-mm. And basically he was out of a job within, you know, an hour of being there. And then we bring him on board. He's, you know, exceeding the expectations. And he, we were talking the other day and he said, you know, this is the first time that I've ever earned my own money, my own paycheck. Wow. And what a great feeling that is. And, you know, the conversation we were having was about now, what do I do? How do I find my own apartment? And how can you say that that's not a success story? Right. 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 And it's just amazing that, you know, when provided the tools 
and the technology and the training, you know, it, it didn't take any longer to onboard a per, onboard him, uh, go through the safety precautions, uh, get familiar with, with the facility. Like you said, do I have to hire somebody that's going to take you around? Um, you know, just it's a normal onboarding process and there's really nothing that changes in, in this process. And I think that's a message that has to get out to hiring managers, uh, HR professionals, et cetera, and organizations in the community. You know, you, it's would... true. You know, and one of the things that you said is about expectations. You know, if we lower expectations, we will live down to them. Mm-hmm. But if you raise expectations, we can also live up to them. And I think that mm-hmm. that's really a key word and whether that, you know, we have our little learners program at the San Francisco Lighthouse. So we start at birth. And if we go in thinking, you know, about, well, this child's blind that, you know, this is probably all they can ever accomplish in their life. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you set that expectation. You know, I don't know. How long have you been in the NIB fold, David? 19 years. 19 years. So do you remember Jim Gibbons? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry. (laughs) Jim Gibbons. Yes, I remember him. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, uh, very early on, I was in the business management training program, which they have a different version of that now. But Jim Gibbons came in. He was the CEO of National Industries for the Blind. And he came in for our very first night there. And I remember he grew up blind and him saying to his parents when he was a little boy that he wanted to grow up and be a pilot someday. Mm -hmm. And so the parents very could have easily said, you know, Jim, you're blind. You're never going to be a pilot. Instead, they told him, said, Jim, you know something, someday you're going to run the airlines. Hmm. What a powerful message and just how you choose those words. And, you know, that has stuck with Hmm. me since 2004. Mm -hmm. And I think about that, you know, (laughs) every time that I either set an expectation for myself or, If I run into somebody that I don't automatically just typecast somebody, I guess, just by 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 uh, by where they're at at that moment or what I think, you know, one of the things Mm. that I've learned in my journey is everybody has a story. So let's sit and listen to those stories. And that's why I love what you're doing here is you're you're highlighting those stories to where they become part of the public record, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. That was very powerful. I did have the pleasure of, of meeting Jim and going through the business management training program as well. That brought me back to my the day I was diagnosed uh, with the RP and the the doctor telling me, you know, or asking me, what is it do you want to do for a career? And you know, well, I'm taking some criminal justice classes. I want to be a police officer. And he says, well, there's no blind cops. Walks out of the room and, okay, I'm stuck holding this big bag of blindness and mm. here's my first experience of somebody telling me what I can't do. And like Just you said, because if, you're blind, right? if you had that conversation, if the conversation kind of following your example was, well, you might not be a beat cop, but you know, if you follow the path and go into criminal justice and studies or be a lawyer or, you know, be a work in administrative office and support or, many other areas of right. public service. That's a different conversation than walking away and leaving somebody holding a bag. And it's amazing. Holding a big like, bag of blindness. I love that. Yeah. And it, it just, it's amazing it's true, that though. it happens every single day, doesn't it? It does. It does. And whether that be a ride share driver that leaves us standing on the side of the road because we're, you know, we decide to use a dog to navigate our world or whether that just be somebody telling you, well, you can't do that. Yeah. I mean, words are powerful, right? Absolutely. And one thing that you do, how do you handle if somebody says, well, you can't do that? Besides maybe bumping them in the nose. Oh, sorry. I didn't see you there. But um... (laughs) I do have a story behind that. And (laughs) (laughs) if anybody did, I know it would have been you. (laughs) Right. You know, you're right. I mean, and there's times that it gets it just it weighs on you as just being a human. I love what you said. It's like you're standing there holding a big bag of blindness. And it's like, what am I going to do with this? And so for me, it's just kind of, I tell everybody I'm from Missouri. I'm not for 
you know, the Missourians out there. I am not from Missouri. Love Missouri. Um, I, I was like, let me show you. Um, and let me show you what I can do. And I kind of think that's my job at this point in my life is just mm-hmm. to say, you know, yes, I can. Um, and, you know, even even I I used to say that, well, you know, I know I can't be a truck driver, but, you know, now with some of the new technologies that's coming out with remote driving, I might be able to be in control of my own vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, just to think of what's out there and, you know, and if we're if we're involved and we are and we're setting the tone and we're doing the narrative, you, you know, if we leave blanks. Somebody mm. else will fill in our narrative for us. I'm not going to let somebody else fill in my I narrative and say that I can't do that just because. Mm. I'm just going to show you that I can. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to do it as well. Mm. Because I have great tools available to me. Right. And does everything work perfectly? Absolutely not. But I know an awful lot of people who are sighted and perfectly able in every single way that have challenges as well. Right. And that's Absolutely. why I say everybody has a story. So true. Uh, I, I love that. You know, my version of that is if you don't if you don't tell your story, somebody else will. Somebody else will. They're most likely not gonna get it right. That's um, right. so it's very important to do that. And for me, I always try and think of it as as an, a learning opportunity when somebody says, Well, you can't do that and it's like, Okay, well, why can't I? Mm-hmm. And build on build on the why. And, That's right. Right. Because it's just just like in manufacturing and you know, mean six sigma and iso processes is why 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 until you get to the answer and that's what i think we need to do more of in terms of that education i don't mean that i want to stand on the corner and be you know everybody's standing on my my soapbox 24 7 i want to be able to live my life and you know you want to come and ask me a question not my wife or somebody i'm with uh ask me the question and let's have a conversation with and seems like that gets lost nowadays, whether it's on really about anything uh, nowadays, it seems like, is let's just talk about it, figure it out. That's funny that you say that. It always kind of cracks me up when you're with somebody, you know, go out to dinner with a friend. It's like, well, what does she want? And Mm. boy, my friends are, you know, they're like, well, why don't you ask her? (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so so do people ever ask your guide dog questions? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's what, I, I haven't oh, had that yet. Other than, oh, you haven't? No. I had uh, a really funny encounter yesterday. Okay. At the airport, somebody just came up and started to pet Pilot. Pilot's my guide dog. He's a yellow lab laying right over here behind me. And um, so knowing what was going on, because he was distracted and they were making ooey cooey noises. So I started to pet them on the head. And they're like, what are you doing? I said, same thing you're doing to my dog. Wow. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Good for you. It is. It's. It's amazing that you know there, people don't gain the concept of you can't see or what blindness is. And you know, I'm I'm standing here with a guide dog, and they're like, okay, you know, over there, and <laughs> which is which oh, is the an, land of over there. That that's my new GPS app. I'm gonna invent. It's called Over There, or it will have turn-by-turn directions, but it won't speak. So it'll be a great tool for people who are blind. You know, that would be a great app that if you just hold your camera up, and when they point to Over There, that then the camera translates that into the GPS, and it actually walks you over to where Over There is. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Yeah, there's Thank so you. many things that's Over There that I still haven't found. <laughs> so any app developers out there listening... Let, let's get together and start having this conversation. I just point over there and get me there. <laughs> Take me to over there. Yeah, that is that is hilarious. So, you know, I, that just makes me smile every time I talk with you and have these conversations. So we're, we're talking about low expectations and things like that. And, you know, what is your, how do you educate people in a way that helps change that perception? Well... I don't know. I'm going to go back to the living your life. I mean, just simply being willing to answer the questions. And somebody told me a long time ago that the only dumb question was the unasked one. So I'd rather somebody ask a Mm -hmm. question, even if they feel uncomfortable asking it, because I tell everybody I'm an open book because somehow rather than just assuming, let's have the dialogue. I mean, really, there's so many things that 
could be done in order to help shape those perceptions that people have. But I live my life on Facebook, and I know probably to an annoying degree at some point, but Mm -hmm. I want people that either have somebody in their family that are blind, that's blind, or them, uh, their selves saying, well, how did you paint your kitchen? You know, I want to have that dialogue. How did you build something and use a power saw? Mm -hmm. I I, I want people to ask those questions because sometimes people just don't know. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem saying it. I have no problem showing it. You know, it's pretty amazing the things that are possible that even I didn't know what was possible. But, Mm. you know, again, if we go to thinking about representation that, you know, instead of having sighted people in the media and on the movies playing people who are blind, let's take the example of the movie that recently came out that had or the docuseries that came out. And why can I not re- remember the name of it right now? Help me out, David. Um, that had the the young lady who was low vision in there that, mm-hmm. that did so well because she has lived experience, right? right. Yep, and, I agree. And we have more representation, but there's still a lot more. And I think that if disability just can become part of the normal conversation rather than being afraid to say the word blind or mm-hmm. low vision mm-hmm. or deaf blind or Or then you flip on the other side and, you know, there's that language that is, well, that that gives these negative negative perceptions. He's like, oh, David, I'm so sorry that you suffer from blindness. Mm -hmm. Are you suffering over there? No, not. Well, it's not yet. When the heat heat comes in, I may be suffering a little bit. Yeah, that's right. You are in Arizona. Right. No, you don't have that 15 degree (laughs) variance that I have here in California. No, no. This makes it absolutely positively lovely. But, you know, I think I think that if we if we promote those positive narratives that, Mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about, but also if we challenge the stereotypes if somebody comes up and says, well, you know, I knew a blind person one time and they did this fill in Mm -hmm. the blank with whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Um, Or they say, well, you know, this is what I think about blind. Have a dialogue. I think it's all about talking and about sharing Mm -hmm. Um, and just let people, you know, get an understanding and empathy will come, you know, 99.9999% of the human population is somebody who will help if we need help. And I think that sometimes that they're afraid that they're going to do something wrong. Sure. Um, I mean, no, we don't want to be driven. You know, somebody come up and grab our shoulders mm-hmm. or grab our cane and walk us across the street. Darn it. I didn't want to cross the street. Right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just just educating about what our needs, wants and desires are, because like I said, this can happen to anybody at, at, at any time we have. 75 million aging baby boomers out there. So mm. this is going to hit people's families and they sure. just need to know what. Well, it, it, it's okay to have the dialogue. It's okay to say the word blind. And on the flip side, it's even okay to say, hey, did you watch TV? Did you see that? Right. We don't even get offended when you say those words. Exactly. And, and like you were just saying, right, is it, disabilities can impact anybody any time, just like for myself. And, and as you m- mentioned on top of the show, your vision uh, impairment came later in life. So you were the first person who was blind that you knew. And when we come to these kind of crossroads and, and have that, and you were talking about perception, and, and I'm sure you had to go through and understand what living as a person who is blind, what that meant to you. And what what was that like? Well, luckily, I had some really great examples to follow. You know, I'm so thankful that, number one, where we are, you know, technology-wise compared to people who paved the way for you and me, especially me, because I'm only 24 years in. And, you know, I think that I really had some great examples to turn to and whether that be with the advocacy organ or the consumer organizations that are out there and just the leaders who were blind in the field. You know, I think about uh, my very first National Industries for the Blind conference. It was 2004. I was a direct labor employee of the year. And my My CEO, Don Legitacy, that we talked about earlier, Mm -hmm. he couldn't wait to introduce me to this really amazing lady who was blind and that ran the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind, Anita Aaron. Mm. 
And, um, you know, because he wanted to give me that blindness positivity that, Mm -hmm. look, these things are possible rather than saying, well, you know, you'll always, you know, we'll always have this job packaging gloves for you. I never thought of that as my only job that I'd ever have because I've seen other people who was in careers Mm -hmm. and doing other things inside and outside of the agency. So, you know, lots of great people that just gave me people to look up to to say, wow, look at that. These mm. things really are positive because I didn't know. I, I had no benchmark whatsoever. I knew Helen Keller. I knew who Helen Keller was because I read the books. I knew who Ray Charles was. I knew the famous people who were blind. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody that was real and blind, mm-hmm. only what was representative on television or what I had read in a book. Um, so, I mean, I was so fortunate to get such early exposure in my career to be able to say, you know, this is possible. And then as much as I have said, you know, over the years, it's like, well, one of these days I'm going to go out and I'm going to go into the private sector and I'm going to do something outside of blindness. I have that option if I want to do it. I mean, after all, I secured an MSW and an MBA. I, I, I have some pretty good chances out there to mm-hmm. go out and do something, but I wanted to give back what was given to me. And I want to serve as the example that, that, that I had so many people to be able to do. And I think about all the hurdles that I didn't have to overcome because of what the people who came before me did. So wow. I'm really lucky. Yeah. Very impactful. And it, it's fantastic that there are leaders out there like yourself that are living the experience and giving back and being that mentor and telling people and not just verbally, but showing it and living the life that if you want it, you can do it. That's right. Sometimes you got to work for it though. Yeah, You you can't be afraid to roll up your sleeves and do the work. So so true. And, And that's, that's where the differentiation comes, right? Is this program is not a given, right? You don't get it up just because you're blind. It's not um, a charity program. It's not a charity sure. program. That's right. And, and same thing in the in the private sector too. Is you'll find companies that are very inclusive. Is because they have a leader that is most likely has somebody in their family with a disability, True. and they're sitting back and going what is the future for for my child or my sibling or whatever it is? And they see that there's this need to create opportunities, create the the pathway for people with disabilities to live the life that they want. And, but it's only seems to be such a small group of those leaders that can see are impacted right because they know they're living it so they know personal story so they have to create something that's not already there within their organization or another area and so then that's their motivation and just like you know the ability one program is recognizing that look you know private sector there's some advancements uh, you know a slight increase in the employment among people with disabilities, which is awesome. But we still have this ginormous figure standing in front of us. And if there's an organization that's willing to create the lines of business to provide basically fee for service or produce a product and sell a product just like any other business in the community, but wants to be inclusive of all people, why why shouldn't we grow that or build that or connect with private sector to help individuals get to where we are and be be that role model or mentor for for others? It's true. And, you know, when you think about it, you know, going back to the statistic of 75 million aging baby boomers, there's not a big enough workforce out there to replace them. And we're learning... You know, we're losing people that are skilled every day. And you think about, you know, logistics and you think about supply chain and all of that stuff. When we have this great qualified workforce or a workforce that can be qualified in whatever. And, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, between San Francisco Lighthouse and Arizona Industries for the Blind and those opportunities are being created. But that can be done everywhere that 
you know, let's plug this workforce in because let me tell you, they're going to be the most faithful em- employees that you ever have. They'll crawl over snowbanks. Well, not in Phoenix. They won't crawl <laughs> over snowbanks. And not in San Francisco. Not in San Francisco. They, they will be your most faithful employees ever because mm-hmm. they're so thankful to have a job because and to be given the opportunity. But, you know, as agencies that serve people who are blind, it's also our job to make sure that they are armed with the tools necessary to compete with everybody else that walks mm-hmm. in off the street. There's a reason why there is a 70% unemployment rate. And some of it is societal, mm-hmm. but also some of it is, is being able to have access to those skills that are needed. Right. A couple of years ago on C-SPAN, I love C-SPAN, by the way. I kind of watch it like the NFL and I yell at it and you know, <laughs> do stuff like that. And about a couple of years ago, I was listening to the, uh, the Winners Governors Convention and they were talking about the workforce, and this had nothing to do with people with disabilities. But they were saying it's the soft skills, it's the water cooler talk, and mm-hmm. it's not the hard skills. You know, college teaches you, you know, the hard skills that you need. It's the mm-hmm. soft skills that is being lost out there somewhere. Mm-hmm. And so, and so, we need to not only have the same qualifications as far as you know, whatever degree or certification program that there needs to be out there. But we also need to have everything else that makes you capable in a workforce. It makes you happy in a workforce. Mm -hmm. And that's why we all concentrate so heavily on our workforce development programs is one to lower that statistic, but to go out there and talk to employers, you know, you think that, you know, here in the San Francisco Bay area, right in the middle of Silicon Valley, you know, and you think about all the high tech jobs that are mm-hmm. available and going out and talking to those people and saying that, you know, these are the things that we can do. But we need to be able to listen to that employer as well to say, what are your needs? And then how do we fit into where those needs are? Because there's jobs out there and there's jobs that's not getting filled. There's people who don't right. want to go back to the office. They need people in the office. And we have a workforce that can do that. So, you know, I encourage anybody who's listening to your podcast out here to be able to say, you know, I'm an employer and I'd like to learn more about this and whether they reach out to you or whoever they reach out to, to let's start having the dialogue of how mm-hmm. we can incorporate people. And part of that is also rethinking about how we do things, whether that be our website or whatever. You know, when we think about universal design, if people who are blind can access it, everybody can access it, right? Absolutely. And and and, and we have people out there who have disposable income that if they can't access your website, guess what? They're not going to buy your product from you. Mm-hmm. And so we can think through those lenses. One of the things that we have at the Lighthouse um, in San Francisco is we have an accessible user experience department that goes out there and does those evaluations for uh, mm-hmm. uh, for companies. But on the flip side of that is, you know, how do we get people into that workforce? And whether that be through scripting and, you know, they're uh, using the screen reading technology like I use. I use a Mac, but, you know, on the Windows side of it, there are several screen reading programs out there. But, you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about this is we're entering into this world of, you know, AI and all of this stuff that all the evil stuff that mm-hmm. they talk about, how right. I can do this, how I can do that. You know, I think about one of the things that, you know, we get somebody into a job. It takes all these hundreds of hours and thousands and thousands of dollars to script a computer and on some type of proprietary software. And then that software updates. Mm-hmm. And it might take two or three more months to get that. And it, that's not being productive to the employer. Sure. But I think like with the use of like AI or some type of tool that we just don't even know about yet, mm-hmm. that it runs, it runs that update at night. It runs through the work processes and whatever is broken. AI just goes in there and writes the script for you. When you come in the next morning, your computer is up and running and you're logging in with your sighted peers. Right. And so I think that there are some things out there that that we can't even imagine the possibilities of yet. But I'm really hopeful that, you know, that the more that we have the dialogue and the more that we talk about this, the more that we can lower that unemployment rate because that's what we're both working for, I know. So Yeah, absolutely. And great, great. Sorry, I got up on a soapbox there, didn't I? <laughs> no, I love it. And there's nobody better than you to be standing up there doing it. And you and you touched on something about the individual, right? And and for organizations that provide the vocational training. Um, and we talk about the the seventy percent unemployment. It's not just the employers, right? We have to make sure that people are trained. Oh, absolutely. They're, they're ready um, and really have that desire to work. How I know 
through uh, your organization there at the San Francisco Lighthouse. You guys provide any vocational training there? Uh, we're working on that. We have okay. a workforce development program, and we're looking at how we don't reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. so to speak, and how do we partner. And so NIB has their Insight program, mm -hmm. which is kind of where all the upward mobility programs has went sure. through. And then there's other organizations. Of course, I want to partner with WSB because I know what they're doing and I know right. what they're doing great at. And so how do we plug all that in? But we have to listen to the employers to see what do they need. Sure. Um, and then and then arm people, you know, if you read, you know, things that how they predict what the workforce is going to do now. And again, we're not talking about disability specific. We're talking about just in general mm -hmm. that people will have seven different careers in their 20 years of work. Mm. That's a lot. And not only sure. that, but a job that one of our people may be able to get 10 years from now. We don't even know what the name of it is or what the skills right. are. And so we need to be able to teach our people to be lifelong learners, to be able mm -hmm. to to pivot, you know, people, not just people who are blind, for, for mm -hmm. anybody who's listening who's blind, people in general just do not like change. We get right. really comfortable in our regular routine and everything that we're doing, and we don't necessarily want to change. But, you know, we're in a society now where change is inevitable. Um, and you can be on the side of the wall that says that progress is optional. And, you know, if progress is optional, you become irrelevant and whether that mm -hmm. be for a business or whether that becomes for an individual that, you know, we don't want to be irrelevant in the things that we do or what we want to see or the life that right. we want to live. We want to be able to live that life and be able to go out there and access what the world has to offer. It's a great big world out there. And there's so many things that, is just so exciting and that the world of work and education and lifelong learning that just will open up for people. So it doesn't matter where you go, go somewhere. Right. Um, and for the employer side, there's plenty of people out there that can help you incorporate. I mean, because we have to know that everybody's got DEI on the end of their tongue. Mm -hmm. And uh, number one, it's DEIA for us. And so we talk about that A being accessibility. Right. And to remember that part of diversity includes disability. And it doesn't have to be this big, scary, taboo subject. Mm -hmm. um, it's just this just happens to be a person who just happens to not be able to see. But as long as they can compete with everybody else, we're not asking you to do a favor and just give them a job. We right. want them to walk in and be able to compete with everybody else. But for you to see them for their capabilities, not their disabilities. Well, I don't think I could say it any better than that. Thank you. That's exactly the message uh, that I try to get out uh, through this platform and as well as through my day-to-day -day activities at AIB. I can't believe that we've kind of just flown through our time, but... Uh, this went just, so fast. It, it did. It did. We just keep on going, but I see the clock is running. So what... How would somebody who's listening to this show live today or find it on the platforms that they get all their podcasts from, how would somebody get in contact with you and San Francisco Lighthouse to learn more about uh, the work that you do and how maybe you can help them in their uh, inclusion efforts? And so really easy, we're <clears throat> lighthouse-sf.org. Um, you can also find me on Facebook. My name's not the easiest to spell, um, <laughs> but um, Sharon Jovanazzo, that's G-I-O-V, like Victor, I-N-A-Z-Z-O. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, X, and of course, LinkedIn out there. And I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with, with anybody at any time, um, but go out there and just do some exploring. And if we ever run into each other, or if we ever have a call, I guarantee you that one, I'm going to leave you laughing, but I'm also going to give you some stuff to think about. So Awesome. Thank you. And, and I hope for everybody uh, listening that um, our conversation today just reinforces my belief that with the right training, right technology, and the right attitude, uh, people who are blind are successful in the workplace and can compete successfully in the workplace. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Arizona Industries for the Blind, for continuing to support this show and getting our message out. Thank you so much, David. It was an honor to be on here, and thanks for the invite. 
Thank you for listening to Changing the Perception of Blindness, one conversation at a time with your host, David Steinmetz. Be sure to subscribe to Changing the Perception of Blindness, one conversation at a time on your favorite podcast platform. And tune in live on Phoenix Business Radio X every third Friday at 9 a.m. We hope you feel inspired by today's conversation and maybe we've even sparked a new idea or opportunity.